Very, very great to be back. Uh, we're starting with a bang. This is a great turnout. We're happy to see y'all. A uh, lot of new faces, special collections. If you're not familiar with our department, we're located here on the second floor, uh, right off of reference is a big sign that says special collections. We are, uh, as Mary Stein likes to call us, Baton Rouge's attic. And the genealogy department, we have a lot of fun up there. We collect a lot of neat stuff. Uh, we have rotating exhibits right now. We have Baton Rouge Staycation. So lots of uh, fun touristy stuff from Baton Rouge in our display cases. So if you have time, um, go upstairs and visit. Check us out. We're really neat. Uh, we do this lecture on the third Wednesday of every month. Next month, we're going to have uh, the uh, superintendent of the USS Kid, Tim Nesmith, come and talk about the ship and the history of the museum. So if you're interested in that, we will be in this room on uh, early May. Wow, May 19th. Uh, tonight, we are very fortunate to have Mary Ann Sternberg here to talk. Uh, she's been exploring and writing about Louisiana for four decades. She's the author of four nonfiction books about Louisiana and a longtime freelance writer. Uh, she's been long interested in our state's history and culture, and we are absolutely thrilled to have her here tonight. Please give her a warm welcome. In any event, I do want to thank the library for inviting me to come and visit with you all this evening on the subject of the River Road. And I think there may be people who are on their Facebook Live. I want to thank them for tuning in, but especially thank you to the people who are here in person. In person is wonderful. And I also hope that this evening will inspire everybody to ramble the River Road yourselves. Many times when authors are invited to speak, it's because they have a new book. I don't. Um, but I can offer books that I hope will entice you all to get out and explore as we emerge from the COVID lockdown. I think this is a good time to talk about the River Road because we're getting into, we're getting into a time when we can start adventuring out just a little. And you can travel to the River Road without having to get on an airplane, which is a good thing. So I hope that this evening you'll learn about some things you want to go out and see for yourself and places you want to explore for yourself. Or you just want to be an armchair traveler and read about it, think about it. I've been researching and writing about the River Road for uh, since 1993. And you might say, well, or more. Yes, okay. more. All right. All right, even better? Oh, that's good. OK. You might say that since I grew up in New Orleans and I've been living in Baton Rouge for a long time, the river road's kind of a natural, but it wasn't. I hadn't thought about doing a writing project on the river road until something happened that I thought, looking back, was kind of serendipity. And that was that in about 1993, my mother, who was a New Orleanian and had taken guests down on the river road forever, came back and said, there's nothing on the River Road anymore. And coincidentally, a couple of weeks later, I was down talking to a director of a museum on the River Road for a project I was doing. And we talked about his museum. And then he was telling me about all the other things that were there. And I thought, wow, that's amazing because we don't know about this, but it's there. So as a writer, I assume there must be a book that would link the people who know with people like my mother and me who did not know. So I went looking for a book, and I found hundreds of books. There were books on plantations and books on uh, riverboats and books on the commerce and books on architecture. 
but there wasn't a book that you could just go out on the river road and see what there was to see. And there was nothing that put it all together in a way that anyone could use to visit the area and know what anything was besides the obvious. And the obvious, of course, were the plantation houses open to the public, which are wonderful, but that's not all that's there. So I tried to write that book along the river road, and it went into its third edition. It offers an overview and a guide to the river road by driving up the east bank and driving down the west bank using your odometer. And it's to help you identify some of what's there and some of what used to be there and to present kind of a spirit of place so that you can understand that the river road has a history and a culture that is so much deeper and richer and broader than just been 19th century antebellum plantation parade. After I updated along the river road for the last time, I realized I'd learned about a number of places that were either unique or I thought really underappreciated. And I thought they begged to be spotlighted. And that led my writing the next two River Road books, which were River Road Rambler, a collection of 15 stories about some of these places, and then River Road Rambler Returns, another 14 about different ones. I did a lot of archival research for all of the books, but the most fun was wandering by the day, exploring, and talking to knowledgeable locals who wanted to share their information because they love their area and they want other people to enjoy it as well. Now let me be specific. The River Road to me is about 100 miles between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Um, it's both banks of the river, East Bank and West Bank. We who live on the East Bank seem to forget there's a West Bank, but there is, and there's a lot over there. And it is the result of layers of traditions and influences from 300 years of settlement, 300 years of residence. There have been Native Americans, French, Germans, British, Spanish, Islanos, black slaves from Africa and the West Indies, three free people of color, Acadians, Anglo-Americans, Italians, and others. The River Road has been constantly changing for the three centuries that it's been documented. In fact, it's changed a lot while I've been watching, and that's only 20 plus years. Some changes are for the better. For instance, most of the plantations didn't used to talk about slavery. And now almost all of them include slavery at some part of their tour or their exhibits so that they are acknowledging the fact that, yes, there were slaves on the plantation. To this end, and you may have already visited, Whitney Plantation, uh, which is down in St. John Parish, um, Whitney Plantation was never open to the public. And then in 2014, it opened as a museum dedicated to the enslaved people. So it's kind of a museum of slavery. On a different topic, in terms of changes for the good, I just read that this building, this is the 19th century um, Lemon department store. It's a lovely Italianate building. And it operated as a department store in downtown Donaldsonville for decades and decades. Um, it closed in about the 1970s, and then briefly in the maybe 80s or early 90s, it was a museum, and then it closed again. And it's been sitting there, and as I've watched, growing a little more derelict and a little more derelict, and now all of a sudden somebody has bought it, and they are going to use it for commercial on the first floor and mixed residential on the second floor, which is 
wonderful news. Then there is this the utterly dilapidated Gottschaw Plantation and Reserve that is being renovated and will have exhibits in it and is scheduled to open in 2022, if all goes well. But changes, of course, always bring loss when you're dealing with an area like this. Uh, this is Germania, which was a wonderful old plantation. It has completely fallen down, all the buildings. This was the barn. It was the Timber Mill Museum in Garyville. Uh, closed, not there. The old Gotcha School in Reserve was right next to the uh, plantation house that's being rehabbed. The school dates from 1909, and they were going to do something about it, and then the roof fell in from one of the recent storms, and so it's be being demolished. And then this loss was really tough on me because this is was the St. James Parish Historical Society Museum in Lutcher, which was like a mini rural life museum telling about the lives of the river Cajuns, and it was terrific. And they dismantled it, and we're going to put it back together somewhere, and it hasn't happened. So um, I'm really sorry. That, like the rest, were all, I think, big losses. Before I go any further about what's out there, uh, I want to address a familiar term, Cancer Alley. Cancer Alley, of course, defines the area along the river where there is a dense population of petrochemical plants and manufacture products with sometimes unpronounceable names. Well, unfortunately, that's my river road. And I'm not here to discuss anything environmental right this minute, but no matter where you come down on that, they don't add much charm to a landscape that purports to want to attract visitors. But the presence is a real part of the River Road. It has been since Standard Oil arrived in Baton Rouge in 1909. So obviously we're talking about well over a century. So I thought I, was, I would address this, and I did it in Rambler Returns. This is the old Inger oil site. It was right on the river road. It was a super fun site. Therefore, it was one of the most toxic in the country. The good news is that it was the first super fun site to bioremediate, uh, neutralize with biological organisms. And the guy who came up with the formulas was at a lab at LSU. It now is right by the side of the road, and you can see what it looks like. It looks like just a nice green area, but there's no sign out. So you can whiz right by it and not know it's there. And I thought it was important to tell about it. On the positive side, however, is another story in Rambler Returns about Ashland Belhelen, which was an iconic plantation, and it was falling down. It probably would have had to be pulled down because the family that had owned it for over a century had, for whatever reason, just kind of let it fall apart. But Shell Chemical, which is on the property right next to it, bought it and renovated it, and it is absolutely spectacular. It's not open to the public because they use it for meetings and things, but they've set up some little exhibit rooms and occasionally they open it. So if you see in the paper or somewhere that it's open, take the opportunity to go. It's well worth seeing. While we're on the subject of industry, industry actually is nothing new to the River Road. 
because if you think about it, every beautiful plantation house, those mansions that we love, the oak alleys and not and so forth, was just the glamorous front face on an industrial complex where a noisy, big and noisy sugar mill was operating on the back acreage. So we've uh, had industry on the River Road since the early 19th century. One of the things I hear people say is that the River Road is really derelict. Desolate in many places. It's got tumbled down buildings and expanses that look like nothing. And I won't argue. There's certainly that. But you have to remember that the River Road is not a managed attraction like Colonial Williamsburg. The River Road is very rural, except in the small communities, and much of it's very poor. And I've learned sometimes ramshackle buildings actually have a really interesting history. But when you don't have a sign out, how are you going to know? So along the river road, tried to interpret this landscape, to note what's there besides the obvious and give it a sense of place. So when you ride along, what is it you see? For example, sugarcane field. No sign. So how would you know that this was the site of the old convent, this lovely old convent that was what the town of convent was named after? It's not there anymore. I have been there for a while, but it's important to know that it was there. Or, for example, there's a street sign that says Crevasse Street. But why would it be named Crevasse Street? Well, it just so happened that's where the Mississippi River broke through in the late 19th century and cut a great big gouge in the landscape that's still there. Um, but there's no sign explaining that either. And then probably those of you who have lived around here for a while know what this is, but a lot of people don't. Ruins of the Cottage Plantation is just south of LSU, downriver from LSU. Um, but the cottage was a wonderful plantation and had grand stories, uh, but there's no sign out there either. So you pass those columns and you wonder, What's that? There are many such clues out along the river roads. So, all right, I'm talking about clues, but what is actually still out there beyond the plantation houses that are open to the public? Well, lots of other plantation houses that are not open to the public and not as well known, but they all have good histories. Glendale, St. Louis, Palo Alto, Bocage, Myrtle Grove, and more. Has anybody been to Evergreen? Uh, Evergreen is the most intact plantation in this area. It's got all of its original buildings, including its rows of slave quarters. Extraordinary place. It's sometimes open and sometimes not. So if you want to go, just check and be sure that it's open, but it's well worth the effort. Architecture along the river road, I find interesting and very varied. If you like housing stock from the late 19th, early 20th century, all the small communities have really charming old houses. Don't go looking for what Architectural Digest. A lot of them aren't in very good shape, but the bones of them are there and they are very attractive and charming. You can also find, when you ride along, numerous Creole cottages, and some of them are original. Creole was an architectural style that was developed uh, with West Indian influences and was used a lot in this area. Uh, some of the houses are original. Some of them date from the late, late 18th century, early 19th century. 
and some of them are just modern adaptations of the style because it's still used. There are plantation stores and general stores out there. There are a lot of historic churches and cemeteries, um, to name a few. St. John the Baptist in Edgard, St. Raphael Cemetery in Point Pleasant, St. Mary's Chapel, Ascension Catholic in Donaldsonville. One of my favorites is St. Michael's Church in Convent. Um, because of the Lord's Grotto. Now, I'll bet that people have been there, right? Please raise your hand if you've been there. Okay, quite a few people have been there. For those of you who haven't, um, what looks like rock and would be rock on any other Lord's Grotto, bag ass, which of course is the residue from processing sugarcane. And the altar is stippled with little shells from the Mississippi River. There is an unseen sugar kettle supporting the arch over the altar. I got into this and wondered who did this and why they did it. And so I had to write a story about it. Then I also love the St. Gabriel Church probably seen it, Victorian looking church, not Victorian. Bones are from 1776 when the church was actually built. But that was amazing. So tromped around in there with the people who know about it and wrote a story about that too. And the B Corps Sholane Synagogue in Donaldsonville. See that it's an Ace Hardware store, but you can also see Victorian Luga on the uh, gable roof, that's from the original Jewish synagogue. Uh, tromped around inside, saw the bones of that. That's a good story as well. I had heard men talking about going on retreat at Manresa forever. And I looked through the gate, through the fence on the river road to see Manresa. And I started doing some research and discovered that the site was four consecutive schools for young men before the Jesuits bought it in 1931 to make it a retreat center. So the property has buildings on it from as early as 1831 when these schools were started. And I decided, of course, I needed to wangle a tour which I did, and got to see a number of the old buildings as well as the gorgeous grounds. And I think that made a good story for Rambler Returns. Some of the most overlooked attractions on the River Road are its wonderful little museums. Each one offers a slice of River Road life. Iberville Museum is in Plaquemine, and it's got a pretty new exhibit about the Atchafalaya Basin, as well as a lot of Iberville Parish history. West Baton Rouge Museum in Port Allen, you've probably been to. It's got wonderful changing exhibits and a permanent sugar-related exhibit. The National Hansen's Disease Museum in Carville, have people been there? Hands up, been there? Okay. Right now, you can't go in the museum proper, but you can pick up a map and take a tour of the community and get a sense of the people, what the lives were like for the people who lived there for a century. I mean, this is where leprosy patients were sent over the course of a century. Um, when I went on one of my visits, I was toured through the museum by one of the last patient's residents. And it was, it's, it was amazing. He has since died. So I was delighted that I got to meet him and hear his story. Uh, that's also Ann Rambler. The Plaquemine and Lot Museum is a wonderful little piece of history. And the River Road African American Museum in Donaldsonville 
has been around for a while. Um, I don't know, you may have seen it when it was at Tescuco and when Tescuco burned 20 years ago, or whatever, it moved across the river to Donaldsonville and is freestanding. Um, they have a couple of outbuildings. The little blue outbuilding in the picture is a Rosenwald school. Four that are left in the state. Um, I don't know if you know about the Rosenwald program. It's, uh, elementary schools that were built 1920s in, in the rural south uh, that Julius Rosenwald, uh, the Sears magnate, helped underwrite. And there were hundreds of them all over the south, a very few of the buildings left. And this one was moved here and they've renovated it. It's not quite open yet, I don't think, but it's coming. There's a new I guess visitor trail in St. John and St. Charles parish uh, parishes. Um, it's based on the 1811 slave rebellion. Uh, it took place in St. John and St. Charles parishes. It was actually the largest slave rebellion in the country, but until 2011, when the bicentennial was observed, people didn't seem to know much about it. Um, and so now they put a trail together. And one of the things on the trail is called the 1811, yeah, 1811 Kid Ori Historic House Museum, which is across. And this is Woodland Plantation. This is where the slave rebellion actually began. And then as it all turned out, Kid Ori, the great late 19th century jazz musician, lived in the slave quarters there. I mean, it wasn't slave quarters, but, it was, but the quarters were still there and he lived there. Uh, another addition in terms is at Hummus House, there is the um, Great River Road Steamboat Museum. And it's got a big exhibit that actually is very much like my Along the River Road book and some New Orleans related exhibits. All right, everybody's always interested in the Civil War. And of course, we know Port Hudson is just north of us, but that's out of my territory. There are Civil War sites and connections along the River Road. And uh, the biggest of them, I suppose, would be Fort Butler in Donaldsonville. Um, archaeologists excavated it and covered you know, I don't know, belt buckles and gun shells and so forth. But it, it's a well-known battle, um, has an interesting story, wrote about that in Rambler Returns. And speaking of archaeology, among the innumerable extensive digs that have taken place on the river road, because you always have to do a dig before anybody can develop anything or change anything. Uh, was the one that took place at Chatsworth Plantation, which you would now know as Lobert's Casino. Um, they, they took all the artifacts that they came up with there and they put them at the Rural Life Museum. Uh, but one of the things they found was the base of the old sugar mill. And um, that, you know, it was all covered up. Nobody knew that it was there. If you love gardens, most of the plantations have something in the way of gardens, but of course, Pumas House, where you've probably all been, has the most extensive and lavish. And traditionally, plantation houses had magnificent gardens. And this doesn't look magnificent at all, but it is the remnant of the Valker M garden, which was a mid 19th century garden that the legendary Valker M. made on his plantation. It had a national reputation. People apparently came from all over the country to see this garden. It had exotic plants and follies and just was extraordinary. It's now private and it is preserved so that while the hardscape is still there, um, the owners are just allowing it to 
back into nature. And I was really lucky to be able to tromp around with the owner and see it. And obviously write a story about it. The sugar industry is, was big on the river road. It's been here since the late 18th century. And in addition to expansions of sugar cane, once upon a time, it was, as I had said before, a mill on every plantation. After the Civil War, uh, several plantations would go together and make a co-op mill. So there were less mills. Today, there's only one working sugar mill on the River Road. And I toured it during grinding season. There's also only one refinery. The sugar mill is Cora, Texas. It's the upper picture with the stack. Uh, Colonial Sugars is a refinery, it's in Gramercy. And Colonial Sugars was a company town in the old fashioned way of a company town where uh, the employees lived in houses that the company owned and they shopped in the store that the company owned and they had recreation sponsored by the company and so forth. There are still some of the original buildings and I'm glad that I wangled. And I must say, it took a lot of persistence on my part that to, to get them to let me in. But it was really a worthwhile venture. And so touring Cora, Texas during grinding season and getting to see uh, Colonial Sugar was fun. And since neither are open to the public, I thought they were good stories. The River Road comes with a lot of tales and lore and local color. And of course, everybody knows this one, best known, Bonfires on the Levee. It's also the Mad Stone of Ashery, which is fun. And the Loop Guru of Bayou Gula, which is fun. And Greek tobacco, which only grows in a little corner of St. James Parish and has its own culture and stories and things. Here's one you probably don't know. Good Ship Pelican. Good Ship Pelican made a sad demise, as you can see at the bottom. Uh, but it was a fun story. And it rests on the bottom of the river in front of Donaldsonville. I have a story about that. The one thing we probably don't think of enough when we're thinking about the river road is the river. The river is why everything is here. And we tend to overlook it, which I think is because of the levee. We live on the inside of the levee. And I think the levee divides the river road into two worlds the one that's familiar to us and the one that's on the batcher and in the water. We rarely visit the one that's on the other side of the levee. And it is an incredibly busy, buzzy world. With specialized maritime industries, warehousing, barge moorings, ocean going ships, tugboats, towboats pushing barges, a ferry route, the Corps of Engineers always at work, and much more. And along the River Road, I had devoted a whole overview chapter to the river. And of course, I had to do river stories, Rambler and Rambler Returns. One of them I wrote was about the Batcher because it's really, um, in some places, it's got stuff on it. And other places, it's completely pastoral. It looks like you're just out in the country with this nice waterway by you. It's, it's, uh, it's fun. Did one about the Bonnie Carey control structure. Um, you ever been to the Bonnie Carey when it's open, when it's been open, and water is rushing through? 
eerie reason to have to go, but it's definitely worth the trip. It's fascinating. Uh, the control structure happens to be on the National Register. My theory is that because it was built in 1931 and they haven't changed a thing since then, uh, that that's how it got there. Anyway, it does its job. It's fascinating. Um, and if you happen to be in that neighborhood when the structure isn't open, there is a Corps of Engineers headquarters there, and there's a nice little exhibit in there that's about what the structure does and workings of uh, river control and that kind of thing, if you're interested. Now, I couldn't exactly just write about things on the bank when I'm saying that the river is a separate place, so I had to get out in the river. So my first adventure was to ride back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth in the pilot house of the Plaquemine Ferry. Plaquemine Ferry. Now you would think that that was boring. It was not boring. Every trip was different because there was something different going on in the river every single time. That was a real eye opener because before that, I had only been parked on the deck in my car just going across. That was fun. I have often been intrigued by this kind of iconic sight of a towboat pushing barges down the river. And I thought, well, what's that like? So again, I wangled my way onto a towboat pushing 40 barges down the river. And I have to say, when we were going under the first bridge, I was standing up with the captain. I thought, oh no. But doggone it, he knew exactly what he was doing. It was amazing. My most exciting adventure, however, on the river was paddling in a Voyager canoe for a day. I joined a trip that was heading from Baton Rouge to the Gulf, and they were camping all along the river. And the campsite that day, um, when they picked me up, they stopped in Paulina. We went from the Sunshine Bridge to Paulina. The place we stopped, or they stopped for the night, I got picked up and came home. Um, a place called Poche Park. I've been exploring the river road for years. I didn't know Poche Park existed, and the reason I didn't is it's on the Batcher, and it's only for canoeists, and kayakers, and rafters who come down the river, who are bringing themselves down the river. And it's very welcoming, and it's the only place like it along our river road. Um, and Mr. Poche, this is Poche and his um, very supportive wife got into it because he wouldn't quit. He has made his bachelor into a welcoming campsite with a fire bowl and table and chairs and um, solar lights and all kinds of things. Just because he wanted to do something, he got interested in people coming down the river. And um, so he did it. I was in charge of anything. This is now what he loves to do, having retired from a job at a plant. Naturally, these all had to be stories for Rambler and Rambler Returns. Now, I have an excuse for my fourth book. It is River Road related. It's about Bayou Manchac, and Bayou Manchac was a distributary of the Mississippi River. There once was an historical marker on the river road that marked the approximate place where Bayou Manchac joined it, but the marker is not there anymore. Bayou Manchac was a boundary of Louisiana Purchase, and it was a standard travel route on the time of the Native Americans because it shortened the way from the Mississippi to the Gulf enormously. It's a lot shorter to go through Bayou Manchac and the Amite River down the lakes into the Gulf 
then to wind your way all the way down the Mississippi. The presence of the Native Americans is still there in the Klein Peter mounds that are considered one of the best prehistoric archaeological sites to date. But they exist in very reduced form and they're on private property in the back of the country club of Louisiana. So um, I guess they were excavated, but um, if the people wanted to dig out the dirt, they could because it's theirs. The Bayou story was really interesting. In addition to the Native Americans, Oh, sorry. Sorry, Lynn. Thank you. I have a tendency to do that. Apologize. The Bayou story also includes Iberville, who came along in 1699, and naturalist William Barton, who came along, Bartram, who came along in 1775, and both of them documented their passage. Anchak's story has revealed British and Spanish colonial settlements, Andrew Jackson, steamboats, mastodons, thousand-year-old cypress, pools of 40-pound fish, and a very peculiar hydrology. It was this hydrology that kept Bayou Manchac from becoming a big commercial art artery because it would have naturally been a cut-through from the Mississippi to the Gulf. The bayou continues to have a lot of natural beauty and great biodiversity. But like almost every waterway in Louisiana I've ever seen suffers from environmental abuse. Happily, however, there is a group who is trying to save Bayou Manchac and also to make it more accessible for people who want to put boats in. We are really lucky to live in a place that is so historical, so interesting, has so much to offer. River Road and Bayou Manchac are part of our neighborhood and I hope that you'll consider rambling them yourself, just for the fun of it. I thank the library again for giving me the opportunity to talk about this and for giving me the opportunity to give you an idea about some place you might want to wander to. Um, I have some books, if anybody wants a book. Um, if there's anybody on Facebook Live, which there may be or there may not be. Uh, but if you're there and you would like to buy a book, I would love to request that you order it from Cotton Bun Books and I can go and autograph it should you wish that. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I will be happy to try and answer them. And again, thank you all for venturing out this evening. I really appreciate it. Thanks.